Mystery Man by Dr. Plague Read by Miles Tridle of The Warning Woods I was just looking for something to make my end-of-summer sleepover amazing. What I got was a sleepover that no one would ever forget. Margot, Jenny, and I had been friends for years, since kindergarten even, and we were getting ready to start seventh grade in a few days and wanted to hold our annual slumber party. I had the pigs in a blanket made, the chips that Margot liked, the sour gummy worms for Jenny, and a huge bottle of Dr. Fizz for us to share. I was getting the movies ready when I realized that I hadn't found our favorite game yet and started hunting through the closet. We had played Mall Madness, a game my mom had given me from when she was young, and it was a hit at any sleepover. We would shop till we drop, charge it up, and then laugh about who got the best deals and spent the least amount of money. It was great. I had probably replaced the batteries in it a dozen times or more, but I just couldn't find it anywhere. It had always been at the top of my closet, right beside my old Barbie travel case, but today it was nowhere to be found. I blew out in exasperation, wondering where it could be, but ultimately decided to go check the attic. It had come from the attic, so maybe mom had put it back up there. I pulled down the ladder, glad it was still daylight so it didn't look so spooky, and went looking for mall madness. It was kind of a chore because mom is something of a hoarder. Dad calls her a pack rat, and it seems pretty fitting. She keeps everything. She had clothes from when my sister and I were little kids. She's got school art projects. She had boxes of old photos and memory books and all kinds of things. I pushed aside a bunch of dresses and found an area dominated by old toys and games that she had saved. It was a mishmash of dolls, books, some old dollhouses, and a couple of dusty board games. I didn't find Mall Madness, but I found about seven others. Apples to Apples was for babies. Uncle Wiggly sounded kind of weird. Don't Wake Daddy was missing pieces, some of which I had lost, and Monopoly took too long. I was about to give up when I saw a black box at the bottom of the stack that I didn't think I had ever seen before. It was covered in dust, the letters barely visible, and as I pulled it out, tugging it quickly so the other boxes wouldn't fall, I wiped off the cover and read the letters slowly. The red on black, hard to read, since it was so faded. Mystery Man, the name proclaimed and I was about to open it to see the instructions when my mom called to let me know my friends were here, and I ran downstairs to see them. I tossed the game onto my bed as I ran past, figuring we would check it out late, and we were soon all laughing and jumping as we got excited for tonight. We ate dinner, we played hide-and-seek in the backyard, we hung out in my treehouse, and as it started to get dark, we came in to watch movies, play games, and start the rest of the evening's activities. Dad worked nights, and Mom didn't really ever make us go to bed when we were having sleepovers. We usually passed out sometime around midnight, but tonight we wanted to stay up till we heard my dad pull in from work. We wanted to see if we could stay up till dawn, just to see if we could, and we had enough snacks and sugar to manage it, we thought. By 11.30, we had watched two movies, eaten most of the snacks, drank half a bottle of soda, and braided each other's hair during the end of Balto. We were a little bored with movies, and Jenny asked if we could play Mall Madness for a little bit. That was when I remembered the game and told them I had something different in mind tonight. The game had worked its way half under my pillow somehow, and when I pulled it out, my friends oohed and awed at it appreciatively. We opened the box and found a blackboard with silver spaces, the big orange phone in the middle having an honest-to-God spin dial on it. We had cards with descriptions on them, and it felt more like we were assembling a police sketch than a dream date. We would go around the board, landing on spaces and drawing cards, and when we found a card with a number on it, we would dial the number, and it would help us determine the identity of our mystery man. So it's a little like dream date then, Margot said. Seems weird, Jenny said, like we're hunting him or something. I looked at the instructions, but they gave no particular instructions on the purpose for making a description of the guy. We would take turns until we had assembled our mystery man, and then we would call triple zero on the phone and give our description to the person on the other end. Somehow, they would know if it was right or not and tell us we had won or tell us to try again. Simple enough, 
I said, and picked up the dice to roll first. It was about four turns later when Jenny landed on a card that gave her a phone call. She tried to dial, but she was having some trouble until I showed her how the rotary phone worked. Mom had shown me, saying it was how they used to call people a million years ago, and once she got the number plugged in, she held the phone against her head and waited for the click. Someone came on after three rings, a weird, staticky voice that I didn't much like, and whatever it told Jenny, she didn't seem to like it either. After a few minutes, she put the phone down, her hands shaking a little. Well, Margot asked, what did it say? I'm, Jenny cleared her throat, clearly trying to get in control of herself. I'm not supposed to tell anyone. The phone man said the call was just for me. She handed me the dice, her hand very sweaty and a little shaky, and we continued. It was my turn to use the phone next, but Margot pulled out a card and laid it down. The card let her steal my phone call, and I laughed a little as I stuck my tongue out at her. She dialed the number and held the phone, interested to hear what was to come. None of us thought it was real. Well, Margot and I didn't, but Jenny scooted a little away as she made her call. The voice picked up, said something quick and harsh, and Margot's smile slipped off her face as she listened. Her lip was trembling as she put the phone down, and she wrote something on a piece of paper and shook her head when I tried to pass her the dice. The guy on the phone said to let you roll again. He said some other stuff, but I'm not supposed to say. I rolled again and grumbled as I landed just shy of a phone space. I wanted to hear what had them so spooked. This was a board game, ages 10 and up and all that, and there was no way it could be that terrifying. We continued taking turns, the girls wanting to keep playing despite their obvious discomfort, and finally, I got my wish. I drew a card after landing on a spot, and it was the phone booth. Searched the deck for a phone call card and dialed a number. I took the first one I found and dialed the number, letting it ring five times before someone picked up. The mystery man is a blonde about six foot tall in a wide-brimmed hat. That's for your ears only, toots, so don't tell any of those other little bitches what I said. I'll know. That was a little weird, and I put the phone down with some hesitation. I didn't think they could say things like that in a board game like this. Margot and Jenny didn't bother to ask what he'd said, and I made notes as Margot took her turn. I had a blonde card and a wide-brimmed hat card, but I didn't have one that said six feet tall. I guessed I would just have to draw for it. Meanwhile, Margot had gotten another phone call, and as she listened, I saw her glance over at Jenny, and the look didn't seem friendly. I didn't know what the phone guy was telling her, but it seemed to be making her mad. We played the game for hours, and in that time, the game got worse and worse. Anytime Jenny got a phone call, it nearly put her in tears. Anytime Margot got a phone call, it seemed to make her angrier and angrier. I tried to take the phone from Jenny at one point, offering to take the call for her, but she shook her head and said the phone man said she had to take it whether she liked it or not. Yeah, Margot said, her eyes looking mean. She needs to take her calls just like the rest of us. As the game went on, we got more clues. I learned that my mystery man was a six foot tall blonde in a wide brimmed hat with a mustache, black pants, and a white shirt. I had most of that, but I was still missing the six foot card and the mustache. The man on the phone had alluded to the fact that Margot would soon make her move against Jenny, the two being like dogs ready to fight. And when Margot threw down a card, it looked more like a knife toss than a friendly showing. White glove, I get to take one of your cards, Jenny. Jenny nodded, holding her card out like a fan, and Margot picked the fourth one, pulling it back smugly before glowering at it. You switched it, she accused, flipping it around to show the green sweater card. Jenny shook her head. Nuh-uh. Yes, you did, Margot accused. The phone man said you were a cheater, but I didn't want to believe him at first. Looks like he was right. 
I never cheated, Jenny said, almost crying. Then why wasn't this the green scarf card? The phone guy... She brought her teeth together, hard, and it sounded like wood clacking together. What? I asked. What did he say? Nothing, Margot said. Doesn't matter. Just play the game. Jenny didn't look like she wanted to continue playing, but she didn't look like she was capable of stopping either. The game would continue whether we wanted to or not, and after that, the phone calls got even weirder. I pulled a card, dialed the number, and was greeted with about 10 seconds of heavy breathing before he spoke. The mystery man has a long, sharp knife. He's walking down the street, turning left on Martin Drive, and will soon be there. That sent a chill through me. Martin Drive? That was two streets away. That was like an easy 20-minute walk. What the heck was this? These weren't pre-recordings. This had to be live, but that was impossible. This game was probably 20 years old at least. It couldn't happen. Look, I said, hanging up the phone. Let's just call this a draw. I think this is getting a little too real and... The orange phone rang, and I felt my words wither in my mouth as we just sat there and looked at it. It was like watching a bomb tick down, none of us wanting to be the one to touch it. It just kept ringing and ringing. And finally, to my surprise, Jenny reached out to pick it up. Her hand shook, her breath coming in quick gasps, and as she lifted it to her ear, I heard someone snarl something, and she winced like she'd been struck. She held the phone out for me, hand moving like someone with nerve damage, and said it was for me. I took it, held it to my ear, and said hello. Whether you play the game or not, you little bitch, the mystery man is still coming. If none of you wins, then he's coming to get all of you. But if one of you manages to win, then they might be safe. You never know. Better finish what you started. I hung up the phone, trying to keep my teeth from chattering as I told them what he said. That's not true, Margot said at once. The phone guy told me I had to beat Jenny or I'd get taken. He said Jenny was trying to win on purpose so the mystery man would get me. Jenny burst into tears. He said that you two were trying to sacrifice me to the mystery man and that I deserved it. He said I was useless, just holding you two back, and I deserved to get dragged away. I thought about it, weighing what they had said. Sounds like if we all win, then he can't get us at all. We have to work together to get out of this. Jenny shook her head. He said that if I told you what my mystery man looked like, he'd get me for sure. Me too, Margot said her anger slowly turning into fear. Well, who cares what he says? He's coming regardless, so we have to do something. So, we started playing the game cooperatively. Helping each other proved a better strategy, and Margot soon had everything for her mystery man. Margot dialed triple zero and declared that her mystery man was five foot four and bald with a hockey mask, a machete, and a white jumpsuit. A voice came from the rotary, making us all jump with its suddenness, and it reverberated around the room. You have discovered your mystery man, Margot. You are safe. For now. We were still for a moment, and then Jenny reluctantly picked up the dice and kept playing. She got a card, dialed the number, and choked out a sob as the man on the phone told her about her mystery man. He's on your street, she said, sobbing a little. And I rolled the dice so we could get to her turn again. White glove, I said. Let me see them. Jenny held up her card, but she started nodding at the one that was five into the stack. I drew it, and sure enough, it was the mustache. Now all I needed was the six foot tall and the knife. Jenny went again drew a card, and breathed a sigh of relief as she dialed triple zero. My mystery man is six feet tall, dark-haired, with a rope and a long coat. The phone made the sound again and declared, Jenny, you have discovered your mystery man. 
You are safe. For now. I had picked up the dice when I heard something creak the door open downstairs. It was long and loud, like a funhouse door at the carnival. I tossed the dice, moved my piece, and drew a card. It was a phone call, and I threw it away and rolled again. I moved, drew, and pumped my fist as I got the six-foot card. I was rolling again when the phone began to ring. It barely covered the sound of a footstep on the bottom of the stairs. I let it ring, rolling and moving like a madman. I drew, but it wasn't what I needed. I got another phone card and threw it away. I could hear my mystery man on the stairs, moving as slow as any horror movie villain. I drew the gun and cursed as I tossed it away. I drew another white glove card, but I tossed it and kept rolling and moving. I could hear him on the stairs, his boots clumping menacingly. I had to find the knife. I had to banish this mystery man. If I didn't, it would be my death. He came onto the landing when the ringing phone became too much, and I picked it up and put it down again. It started to ring after a few seconds, and I did it again before moving my piece. I could still hear his boots in the hallway that led to my room, and they grew louder by the second. Jenny and Margo were watching the door to my bedroom like it might explode, but I was focused on my task. Rope. Tossed. Clump. 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 A wide brim hat. Tossed. Clump. 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 He was walking past my little sister's room now. He'd pass mom and dad's room after that, and then it would be down to my room at the end of the hall. What would happen if he got me? Would they even believe Margo and Jenny? Would the mystery man leave them alone once he got me? I didn't know, but my heart leapt into my throat. I had the knife. I was done. I dialed triple zero as something opened the door to my room. Jenny and Margo gasped, sliding away from the board and as far from the door as they could get. My mystery man has blonde hair, a wide-brimmed hat, is six feet tall, has black pants and a white shirt and a knife. I practically screamed it into the phone, falling forward to cover it as I expected that long, sharp knife to stab into me at any minute. I heard the tone, and then the phone crackled out. That was a close one, Heather. You're safe from your mystery man. For now. I just lay there for a while, panting and trembling as Margot and Jenny came to comfort me. They told me they had seen him standing in the doorway, his blonde hair spilling beneath his hat and a sharp knife in his hand. He had raised it, took a single step, and then just disappeared into nothingness. We lay there, just kind of basking in the feeling of still being alive, until I heard Dad pull into the driveway. We had made it. We stayed up till sunrise, just like we wanted to. I went down and hugged my dad, who seemed surprised I was still awake, but glad to see me. And then the three of us turned in. I put Mystery Man back in the attic and have never touched it since. One brush with death was enough for me. So if you find a copy of your own while trolling through the thrift stores and antique malls in your area, be very careful with it. The Mystery Man you find might not be a mystery for very long. That was Mystery Man by Dr. Plague. If you liked this story and you want to hear more, check out Dr. Plague's YouTube channel and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. I think if you're a fan of my stories here on The Warning Woods, you'll really enjoy what he's doing over there. So check it out, enjoy, and you will hear more from me on Thursday.